Well, church, I hope that uh, our time in the different prayers that we have done over the past five, six weeks have been a blessing. They have been an incredible blessing to me as I have put them together. And I believe that today will be the culmination of all that we have uh, looked at in these five, six weeks. I didn't expect it to be because the lectionary kind of drew me into this passage as we get ready for Lent. And I just want to stop mm -hmm. there and say uh, we will have our Ash Wednesday service coming Wednesday on Zoom. Okay, so... If you'd like to attend the Ash Wednesday service, uh, write in to us. Uh, the email ID is at the end of this service and ask for the Zoom link and we'll be happy to send it to you. But it will be at 8 o'clock this Wednesday on the 2nd of March. So the lectionary put this out as the theme for today as we uh, look ahead to starting our time of Lent and it's the transfiguration uh, and the account that we find in Luke's gospel the ninth chapter beginning at verse 28 so if you have your Bibles if you'd like to turn with me and uh, read along I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation Luke chapter 9 verse 28 about eight days later Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzlingly white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Heavenly Father, would you take these words and apply it to our hearts under the illumination of your Holy Spirit's guidance so that we would be able to see what you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, it's interesting that uh, all three of the synoptic gospels have this particular account of the transfiguration of Jesus and all of them uh, follow the, uh, the question that uh, Jesus asked of the disciples, but who do you say that I am? And that revelation that Peter brought, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. All of them follow that particular account. But Luke has a very particular emphasis on prayer, which is why I said that it seems to be a culmination of where we're going to be today after the six weeks that we spent looking at different aspects of prayer. Because in, in different accounts that we look at, we see him talking about prayer, including prayer, uh, especially here. Jesus had gone up on the mountain specifically to pray, verse 28. And neither mentioned that Jesus was praying when the transfiguration occurs, both Matthew and Luke. In fact, it is significant that throughout Luke's writings, we see how he makes it a point to talk about prayer. Following the baptism of Jesus, 
The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus while he is praying. Jesus' selection of the 12 apostles occurs after spending an entire night in prayer. Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah occurs in the context of Jesus praying. And all of these references uh, in the ninth chapter, in the sixth chapter, in the third chapter, other key places where Luke shows Jesus praying include, of course, the garden before his arrest in chapter 22, and then on the cross in uh, chapter 23. But it seems that he takes a lot of pain to show how important prayer was in this journey that Jesus had. Other Gospels also talk about prayer and we can see the importance. And yet Luke seems to make a point of it in his writings. But the other thing that we need to uh, kind of look at is that prayer for Jesus involved at times a dramatic encounter of God's presence. That when he went to pray, somehow it, it was anticipating God showing up, God speaking to him, God revealing things to him so that he would be able to go forward. Prayer was not merely just speaking words to God, but was a truly spiritual experience of God. And then we can see uh, even in the Acts that is written by Luke, how again he accents uh, the gathering of the church, prayer, the centurion Cornelius' prayer, uh, Paul and Silas are freed from God while the uh, church was praying. Paul, all of this brings into sharp focus the fact that uh, Luke considered it very important that prayer was so integral to all that uh, Jesus did. And the fact that as he began to uh, kind of walk into the role that he was given by the Father when he came, that it, prayer helped him to connect uh, his humanity with the divinity of God, to know exactly what God was wanting him to do at particular moments. Because you remember, he was fully human as he walked here on earth while being fully divine. So his proximity with God in these prayer times helped him to understand his role and to walk in, in it. So let's just look at this particular passage and see what we can uh, get or glean from it. We see, first of all, that eight days later, Jesus took Peter, James and John up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzlingly white. So eight days after this incident where he had asked the disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And it's already uh, kind of begun to progress towards Jerusalem because he's already talking about his death. If we look at chapter 9, at the verse 21, he warns his disciples and he says, the son of man must suffer many terrible things. He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. So he's beginning to share with the disciples what's going to happen. And yet as we read other passages, we see that they didn't receive it. They not only couldn't see it, but when they heard it, they rejected it because you remember when Peter heard it, he took Jesus aside and said, no, this will not happen to you. And Jesus rebuked him in the strongest possible words or terms, isn't it? So even though he was sharing this with the disciples, they weren't actually understanding the full import of all that he was trying to communicate to them. And here's Jesus up on the mountain and he's taken his three closest, Peter, James and John. And he's praying and all of a sudden his face is radiant and his, his clothes become dazzlingly white. And then it says that Moses and Elijah appeared and they began talking with Jesus. So Jesus, Moses and Elijah are talking and that they were a glorious sight. 
What were they talking about? It says here, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. In other words, they were talking about what was going to happen to Jesus, that he was going to leave the world and that it was going to happen in Jerusalem. Interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus often referred back and he said the law and the prophets. In fact, when he was talking to the disciples, he said, why haven't you understood this? Because everything that happened to me was found in the law and the prophets. And here we see the law kind of epitomized by Moses and the prophets by Elijah. And both of them come together and they are talking about his uh, exodus from the world. Something that Jesus had said was written there, spoken about. They were now talking to him about it and almost affirming for Jesus that this is what needed to happen. In a, in a strange way when you look at it. And it made me stop and think about Jesus. What was his state of mind at this point? Was he lonely? Was he, you know, just feeling like he was the only person who was carrying this knowledge of what he had come to do, even though he had shared it with his disciples, they couldn't understand. I thought, my goodness, that must have been a lonely road to walk. That you're trying to tell the people closest to you, this is what's going to happen to me. And they cannot see it. They couldn't see it. And yet, on this mountain, he gets this mountaintop experience where these two from antiquity, God brings them into his presence and tells him through them about what was going to happen. They were talking about Jesus' exodus from the world. In other words, affirming almost that he was on the right track and this was where he was supposed to go. You remember that later we see Jesus turned and irrevocably moved towards Jerusalem, knowing that this was where he had to go. And Moses and Elijah kind of confirmed that for Jesus in this moment. And I wonder whether Jesus needed that confirmation. That as he went about his every day, as he met with his disciples, that he was just unsure or saddened or what? Because he went through all the emotions we, we go through, isn't it? To see that the closest people don't recognize what's going to happen to him. Don't even want it to happen because they don't see, cannot understand this whole picture. And yet, in this moment, God decided that he was going to encourage his son. And he brings to that mount Moses and Elijah. And they talk about Jesus and what was going to happen. And then the Bible tells us that when they woke up, the, the disciples woke up, they saw the glory of Jesus and the two men standing with them. And then as Moses and Elijah started to leave, Peter not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Here's the thing. Just as Peter, he wasn't seeing anything spiritual in this. He was still anchored in almost his mortality. And he's thinking, oh my goodness, this is a wonderful thing. How do we remember it? Let's just make three kind of memorials so that we can always come back here and say, this was the place where we saw Jesus. And even as he was thinking in these terms, it's almost like God shushed him, quiet him down, because it says, but even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Can you imagine that? They're standing there and they see Jesus in this, his glory 
Moses and Elijah and as they are these two are beginning to move away Peter saying Lord let's make these three memorials and suddenly this cloud begins to come down and cover them then the Bible tells us his voice comes to them saying this is my son my chosen one listen to him listen says terror gripped them before the voice came i wonder what would have happened after they heard the voice isn't it what a what a moment then it ends by saying they didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen they didn't tell anyone what they had seen well beloved I looked at that and just reading through it was stimulating. Just an invigorating passage. Because just in the reading of it, you can realize how much the Father loves and loved Jesus at that moment to bring this affirmation. But also, what the father did in trying to let the disciples know that they had to listen to his son that this was his chosen one and they had to listen to him almost giving an impetus to the things that jesus had been talking about and i think that that's a good word for us to listen to Jesus. We're going to be heading into Lent from Ash Wednesday. And we've talked about prayer. And Lent affords us the opportunity to spend much time in prayer and, and fasting, if you will. Trying to draw closer to God. To hear Him. To hear Him speak to understand the precepts, the things that are in the Word, to get fresh revelation <clears throat> from Him, even direction. But just to, as I've said many, many times, to just have at this time a holy dissatisfaction with our spiritual lives and say, during these 40 days, this is what I want to do. I want to draw closer, closer to God so that I can hear Him. And then even beyond that, to be able to say, and I will listen to him. It says that the disciples were asleep when, when this momentous occasion occurred. And it occurred to me that when we... sometimes go through crisis moments and we ought to go to the Lord in prayer. Sometimes we balk at it just thinking, gosh, I, I know God can see this. I know that He can hear me. And we don't. And maybe we miss a wonderful moment in our lives. I wonder whether it's because we are uh, disciples were sleepy, they were tired. Maybe we're tired too, we're distracted. Maybe we haven't realized the moment as they too had. Maybe we're thinking more fleshly as Peter did. Let's immortalize this moment. This Prayer time is such a good time, isn't it, beloved? As Jesus showed us that he always expected an encounter with God. Not just one way, Lord, this is what I want. But to be able to have an encounter with God. And maybe this 
period ahead is where God is leading us to have multiple encounters with him that just change us. Change us completely from ones who just go to him asking for things for us to understanding what his heart is for us and the world. And having him almost authenticate that we too are his chosen ones. And maybe even inviting people around us to listen because we are his messengers of reconciliation even. I wonder whether that's what he's laying on you today. But you know, there's one other thing that I believe that we need to wrap our minds around and it is even as we look at this word, these words that God spoke, listen to him. I think that they are connected to the question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Because when we answer that question, then we will be able to understand whether we will listen to him partially or totally. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he your friend, your brother? The one who's given you a ticket to heaven? Savior? Lord? Who is Jesus to you? and to me. Because that is the most important question. We ought to be able to say he is the Christ, the son of the living God, just as Peter did. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who has come to give salvation to me. He is my savior and now he is my Lord. And I walk every day wanting to be in perfect accordance with his will. How do I do that? I do that by listening to him. Beloved, as you know, there's a big difference between hearing from him and listening to him. We can walk in proximity to him and hear him speak to us and yet not listen. But if he is our Lord as well, then we ought to listen to every word that he speaks. Every word that he has spoken as well from the pages of the word. Scholars who do these kinds of things tell us that the words of Jesus, his words in the New Testament are about 20,000. 20,000 words that he has spoken. It would be great isn't it, to just go through those words. And see how you can refresh them in your own spirit, in your own walk with him. Who do you say that I am? And will you listen to him? One last thing I want to say to you. Maybe, beloved, you're in that place too that Jesus possibly was. You're in a lonely place. You're doing something that you don't have support for, but you know it's the right thing to do. People around you are trying to dissuade you. And maybe there's opposition as well. And it's not an easy road. I want to invite you to just turn to God and say, Lord, I need, I need affirmation from you. I need confirmation that I'm on the right path. I need you to touch my spirit in such a way that I come away just sure about what I'm doing.
I need you to authenticate this mission, this plan that you have placed on my life. Who do you say that I am? Is still the underlying question. Whether it is in this area or in the other. Answer that question, beloved. And then let's go to the Lord in prayer and expect, expect a spiritual experience with Him. And I pray that you will have many such mountaintop experiences as we go through this period of Lent that will just transform each one of us for the journey that is in front. May God bless us.